Uh, so I'll start. I'll start again. So welcome everybody to the fourth abolitionist uh, approach webinar. Um, in this um, in this webinar, uh, Gary and Anna are going to deal with some issues relating to um, advocating for animals, um, uh, along with the the abolitionist approach. Um, now we've got some we've got some questions that have already been asked, and we'll be taking some questions from from viewers later on. And Gary and Anna are going to talk about one or two issues which I'm sure are dear to their heart. And and I'm told that uh, later on, at some point. Um, they are going to tell us what exciting things they've been up to recently, um, and I'm sure we'd all be very interested in in those. So, um, not too bad at that. Only ten minutes, so I'll have to speak a little bit quicker and get a few more questions in. Okay. So, okay. would you perhaps you like to say hello to everybody? Hi. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so, so, sorry, yes. I know some people are up very early, and I hope that we've caught uh, people in Australia before it gets too late for them. As you know, we have six dogs in this house, um, so they'll probably, they're visiting already. So um, they, they may be a part of this webinar too. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, start off with uh, we've got I think three questions from uh, from uh, people that were asked before the um, before the uh, webinar started. So uh, we'll we'll get these underway for you. So the first question is from Helen, who lives in London. Um, now, Helen, um, although she lives in London, says she doesn't uh, know many vegans and she'd like to do some advocacy on her own. So um, she says, what can I do by myself to advocate for animals? Well, you know, I, I think that's a great question. Um, thank you, Helen. Uh, I think the the um, there's a tendency to believe that we we can't do anything unless we're working with large groups of other people. This is the psychology that sort of has, has made the, um, that has given a great amount of success to these groups because they've convinced people that, that people have to be working with these groups in order to do uh, advocacy. And first of all, those groups uh, are not doing uh, abolitionist work at all. Uh, most of them don't even, well, none of them promotes veganism as a moral baseline. So working with those groups is um, not going to be productive at all. But I think it's really important to understand the most important element uh, of the movement is the individual. The If everyone who is now a vegan convinced one other person in the next year to go vegan, just one, one other person, then, and that repeated itself for the next 10 years, we'd basically have a vegan world. 10 or 12 years, we'd have a vegan world. The You can't underestimate the importance of the individual. You don't judge a movement by how many people are employed full-time as professional advocates. You judge a movement by how many people embrace the principles in their day-to-day -day lives. And so what's really important is that you, as an individual, get out there and talk with your friends and your family and the people in your circle and explain to them why you are vegan. Convince them to go vegan. And so I think, Helen, you don't need anybody but you. You need to educate yourself and then you need to get out there and educate. You know, going vegan is the most important step, activist step the individual can take. And then after that person becomes a vegan, the next most important thing is to get out there and talk to people on a one-to-one -one basis. And, you know, everybody you can. Don't let a day go by without talking to people about veganism. But it's also a matter of... Um you know we understand that veganism is a way of life not just a diet so it's a matter of extending the amount of communication you do about the way of life that you yeah. are, are following so most of our communication with other humans isn't from behind a desk with a banner or a, or something that you're selling or you're yelling at them or something that isn't the way that we communicate about most things so it's, 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 you can use your normal ways of communication, perhaps spreading out the, the uh, group of people that you're trying to meet, but talking to people, listening to people, um, bringing them the benefit of what you've learned and your suggestions. That's, that's a, a very effective way of um, making vegan, the veganism idea stick with the people that you're talking to. There is a place, and I'm sure we'll talk about it later, for tabling and, 
and that sort of uh, outreach, but, but everyone on their own can engage in what is the most effective outreach method, which is talking, engaged one-on-one -on -one with other people. Unfortunately, we're, we're sharing a um, headphone here because our splitter wasn't working. So. Yes, and things are being, <laughs> so, thing, things are, things so are getting pulled. So one person moves, the other person has to go with them. Things, things are go. getting, <laughs> things are getting, things are getting pulled off the desk because the dogs, uh, you probably can't, but we've got like one, two, three, there are Everyone four, there over. are four dogs here now in right by our feet and they're all starting to like sort of fight with each you know play with each other <laughs> and they're pulling things off the desk mm -hmm. um as they just did okay well we'll just leave it on the leave it on the, on the ground okay all, all, um, I, all yeah. I can all i can say is it's like you haven't just had an argument before you started yeah <laughs> it's yeah. Very close. Um, yeah exactly um i, I so there we go. There we we may go. have an argument before there, the end there of the go. webinar. There, there we go. go. There All we right. Go. Um, Ken, before, you know, before you, sorry, Gary, before you carry on, can I just ask you to turn your mic up a little bit? You're a, a little bit, um, your volume is a bit low, apparently. Okay. Can you just r raise the volume of your microphone just a fraction? I, I can try. Um, does that raise it? I think that's uh -huh. louder. Yeah, that's better. That Thank better? you. Okay. Yeah. Um, of course, Alan, now you're breaking my eardrum. <laughs> Um, what I hear, <laughs> right, right. But anything for animals, you know, for the animals, uh, you know, um, look, tabling is great. I love, I think tabling is terrific. And, um, and, and, you know, when there are events or, or markets or fairs or whatever, and people are out there tabling, I think that's fantastic. Um, and, and I think tabling in a, in a, 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 a metric, you know, in an area where there's a lot of foot traffic is terrific, but you don't need to table, you know, I mean, if you want to do that, that's great. And we can help you do that. And we can give you all sorts of advice about how to do that. And we have a lot of abolitionist vegan advocates who do table, but you don't have to do it. Um, you know, if all you do is go vegan and then speak to everybody you can about veganism, you're doing a wonderful thing and you're going to help change the world. I mean, and what I mean about, you know, when I say talking with everyone, you know, I, I was making plane reservations recently and and I said, you know, I'm, I, I need a vegan meal. And um, the person who was taking the booking said, oh, you know, you're a vegan. And I said, yes, we ended up spending 20 minutes on the phone. Person probably got fired um, for for, you know, I mean, we spent 20 minutes on the phone talking about veganism. And I gave her the how do I go vegan dot com site. Um, and so, you know, talk to anybody and everybody you can about veganism. That's the most important thing to do. It's, it, it's got to be a part of your life. And if it's a part, you know, and, 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 and it's something that you're doing, it's who you are and, who, and you're sharing who you are with everybody you can. Okay, that's brilliant. Thanks, thanks very much for that. Um, uh, so, I mean, certainly I can assess that. You can talk to just about anybody about veganism at any time. Um, and the, the numbers of opportunities to do it, as you know, are phenomenal, really. You wouldn't, you, 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 it's difficult to believe how many chances you get to talk about veganism from just um, just everyday life. So that's, that's great advice. And I hope, Helen, if you're, uh, if you're um, actually watching, perhaps you'd give us a, a quick note on the, um, on the message to, on the chat to see uh, to show us you're happy with that answer. It's a great answer. Okay, so the next question is from Sydney. Um, that's Sydney, Australia, I should say, not the chap's name. Um, the, question is, <laughs> the question is actually uh, Lewis. Um, Lewis says, why is it so difficult to discuss veganism with family? Uh, <laughs> because. And we're coming uh, up into, from, from many people into the heavy yeah, family uh, yeah, time. So it's yeah. tough for people, I know. It's difficult. And I think, I don't know, I mean, I think as a cultural matter, uh, the way things work is, you know, parents teach children morality. Older siblings teach younger siblings morality. It is not common for children to question parents' morality in any context. And, um, and so when you're, when you're a vegan and you're trying to um, educate your parents or your older siblings about veganism, it becomes difficult because that's not the way the paradigm works. It's not the way, you know, I mean, it's not the way our, it's not the way it works. They teach us about morality. We don't question their morality and ask them to change their morality. 
And, and as I say, I think that works for just about every aspect of life. Um, but uh, so it's not surprising to me that, um, that, you know, I mean, just as, for example, um, I remember, you know, in, in, in the 1960s, uh, you know, when younger people were, you know, protesting the Vietnam War, it, most people's parents were sort of horrified by the fact that uh, their children were acting in what they thought to be unpatriotic ways. And, and um, you know, so whatever, you know, whether it's war or whether it's, it's you know, resource distribution or whatever, I mean, I mean our, our, fa- our parents have their ideas about morality and they convey them to us. We, the general model is we're not sort of challenging them and saying in any context and saying, no, you're wrong. And, and so I think, you know, um, it's hard to talk to your parents about veganism because what you're doing in essence is challenging, um, you, you're basically saying, look, there's something about, about your behavior, which is morally troubling, immoral. And, um, and, and I think that that's a difficult, that's a difficult thing to do. Do you, would you agree? And also, um, I think that's absolutely true, but there's also um, a choose your moment element of this sort of thing. I mean, you may be having tension with the family that you live with, but you also may be having uh, nervousness about uh, getting together with family you only see occasionally. As I said, it's we're coming up to the midwinter um, holiday season. Um, so it, if you think about it, if, if the rest of the family is gathered around a, a festive table centered on a dead bird and whoever is doing the cooking in the family has been up since even earlier than many of you have been up, up this morning to join this webinar, getting the bird ready. And they remember their grandmother getting that bird ready on, on, on the table too. You're not just talking about the bird if you're going to have your vegan um, conversation then. So it's probably the worst time to do it, um, it a, a less emotionally charged um, situation would be better. That said, you have a right to have your beliefs respected. And I, I hear these stories and I find it very sad that people are, are sort of provoked on the vegan question or, or, or around their dietary choices, um, which is usually where the clash is with family. Um, because we always say, if I, if I knew that a guest at my table was having trouble with alcohol and I don't have a tr- problem with alcohol, I think it would be considerate of the other guests not to be chucking down the alcohol around someone who has a problem. That's just kindness and and respect and and compassion for someone else so i don't think you have to to um accept rudeness or hostility about your your ethical choices when it comes to your diet um and i hope that families would would give each other that respect but we recognize that it doesn't always happen so choosing your moment um is a good thing to do if it if you know you're going to have a clash with your family join them after the meal you know you could do something really useful on that day, volunteer somewhere, be, ha, have an, it, it may be an excuse to get around the vegan clash with your family, but it's a good thing to do. You know, the shelters and the human shelters, the animal shelters, the hospitals need volunteers. Go and do something like that and join your family for the coffee with soy milk later. Yeah, I think, I think also, um, you know, going off of what Anna just said, in many, many times, uh, you know, you haven't seen your, your family for like, you know, since last year, you go home, you walk in, you start arguing with them about dinner. Well, you know, and oftentimes when you're arguing with your family, you're not really arguing with them about what you're arguing with them about. You're arguing with them about other stuff. That's another problem. Um, and a third factor is when you talk to people, it's really important to, you know, make it clear that you know, if you start telling people, well, you know, you're no different than a Nazi, um, you know, that, that's really, you know, like whenever, whenever you get to that point in a conversation, it's over with, um, you know, when you get to the Nazi point, um, you know, and you say, well, you know, you're no different from a Nazi or, you know, you're no different from, you know, the Southerners who were lynching, you know, people and whatever. Um, that's not a good place to be in terms of if you want to have a conversation with somebody, anybody, but particularly your family. Um, so I think it's really important to sort of make it clear that, you know, you're not, you're not saying that, um, 
you're saying that that what you know that that the exploitation of animals is immoral and um but you're not judging them i think that's a general thing to be really th thoughtful about in terms of your communication with people whether it's your parents or whether it's anybody else the important thing is to focus on the, the conduct, the institutionalized exploitation and explaining to people and educating people about so why it's wrong. And and but not but making it clear that you're not judging them uh, and you're you know, you're not because, you know, it is is your grandmother who's made the turkey. Has she done something morally wrong? Yup. Has she violated the fundamental rights of animals in doing what she's done? Yup. Is your grandmother the same as a Nazi? Nope. Um, and the reason for that is 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 that morality and moral culpability has a lot to do with intention. And you know, people think. I mean, you know, that people think that eating animals is just fine. That there's not that it's normal. It's a normal, natural activity like breathing or drinking water. And what you need to do is to educate them about why that's not the case. But when they're start when the starting point is what we're doing is something that is no different from drinking water or breathing air. Uh, and then you say, yeah, but, you know, you're a Nazi. Um, that's just a really that's not that's not helpful. That's not helpful as a as a you know, it, 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 it's not going to lead to a productive conversation. OK, thanks. Yeah, I mean, uh... I think uh, to a certain extent, I mean, I suppose in some ways there's plenty more sort of uh, cherries in the orchard, really, and perhaps the family are the, the people that you sometimes need to worry about least. It's certainly in my experience, it's a, a lot easier to talk to people you don't know because it's not it's not as emotionally charged by any by Absolutely. Any Absolutely. at all. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Whenever, whenever you're talking with your family, you're like, you know, you're always talking about something else. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, there's all... Or, e e or, or, or let me say that differently. There's always something else that sort of helps form form the context of the conversation. So you know, it, it, it's it, it's very different from having a conversation with a stranger about veganism because you have no relationship to that person. You have no history with that person. So our third question really is is kind of related in a way. This this one comes from from Jane, who asks, "How do you deal with your friends?" Who uh, who don't take your veganism seriously? Well, I mean, we'll we'll all always have acquaintances until we get more efficient with our vegan education and turn the world more vegan than it presently is. We're all going to have acquaintances and colleagues who are not um, not vegan and don't understand it, and indeed may be hostile. Once we get into <clears throat> the the area of our of our friends, um, then it's a somewhat of the same answer to the last question that I gave is um, I don't think you have to take nonsense about stuff. Um, I'm sure they'll be joking and ribbing about about things, but um, there's no reason to, to take abuse on the issue. I think if people see that you are consistent in your in your veganism, I think that's a that's a helpful statement. It's not something to be taken lightly on your part so it's less likely to be something that they will take lightly when they deal with you so i think consistent veganism is something that they need to see on your part it's your obligation to be consistent but it's good for them to see it um again uh, you know it, it, through life we we add friends and we shed some and so if, if your um, connection with your friends is always difficult for you it's going to be less likely that they'll stay your friends um i think it's good um, to be the person who, um, you know, we, we all need to take an extra step because we're in the minority here. So there's a there's an image that's pushed um, for various reasons by various people of, you know, the angry vegan and no fun and they've always got something to say about something and they're always being politically correct about this, that and the other and they, you know, they can't live a no normal lifestyle and be a normal person. So uh, the more that we are the the generally functioning, um, uh, sociable, happy um, vegan, I, I think that helps uh, stop that stereotype from infecting everything also. You know, take, if you're getting together with your friends, to go the extra mile, take something absolutely scrumptious with you to for dinner, then you've got something to eat. And I always find that my non-vegan friends eat my vegan food anyway. It's always the first thing that goes. So show them it's not deprivation, show them that you don't have to drop out of whatever life you're normally living in order to 
be, be um, consistent in your veganism. So that, that's education too. We're all doing education in terms of being the face of veganism that people are un unaware of or nervous about or even hostile to. You're representing really veganism and all these interactions with your friends included. And, and you know, again, remember, people think eating animals, wearing animals, using animals is normal. They really do. It's, you know, uh, slavery. When you can, you know, uh, um, the the animals are property. In chattel slavery, human beings are property. And we've now seen some recent news information about the fact that chattel slavery is alive and well and people are still being bought and sold. And um, and 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 so human slavery and and animal animals as property are similar in the sense that you have sentient beings who are being treated as resources and whose interests will always be undervalued because of their property status. But it's very difficult to start analogizing people who are not vegans to slave owners because slavery was always controversial. Even when it was pervasive, it was still very controversial. So people were aware of it as, a, as an activity that was constantly being challenged as immoral. That is not the case with animal exploitation. Yes, there are some of us who challenge it. Most animal people don't challenge animal use. They challenge inhumane treatment, and they argue that treatment's got to be better, and most people don't disagree with that. Um, but people don't see the use itself as immoral. This is what we try to do as abolitionists, and this is what abolitionist advocacy, vegan advocacy is about, is convincing people and educating people about animal use. There's treatment and there's use. They're two separate issues. And, and, and our position as abolitionists is that we don't really care how humane the treatment is, the use is morally wrong. The, the, the treatment's never going to be particularly humane because um, of the property status of animals, the level of animal welfare will always be very low. But, you know, even if you hypothesize a situation in which someone's got, you know, uh, some animals that uh, they keep in their backyard and they treat them as members of the family and they give them great treatment and then, you know, they, they kill them while they're sleeping, they shoot them while they're sleeping or something. Um, that would that's still wrong that's unjust uh because you have no right to take the life of those of those animals there's 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 suffering and there's death these are different interests and so what we in the abolitionist movement try to do is to convince people that animal use itself is wrong irrespective of treatment and that's a you know that's a relatively novel idea particularly in the current Situ current context, the current uh, 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 social context, where the overwhelming number of animal people are not saying that. The overwhelming number of animal people are saying, well, they should, you know, cage free eggs and crate free pork and, you know, let's focus on factory farming. You know, but but the animal groups are not. There is no animal group in the United States, Great Britain, or as far as I know, any place else. There is no animal charity that takes the position that veganism is a moral baseline and that it is wrong to eat, wear, and use animals, irrespective of how well you treat them. It's just wrong to exploit them and treat them as human resources. No organization does it. There's no context for this. This is why the abolitionist movement is unique in this respect, because it's taking the position that animal use is itself wrong and separates the issue of use from the issue of treatment. And so the the it's very important to understand. Most people just don't see this at all. They don't get they don't understand this. And even if they even if they're animal lovers or whatever you want to call them, they're they're you know, their their thinking is confused because you know, they've got all of these groups out there uh, who send them all of the mailings, you know, and, 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 you know, that, that, that are on the, you know, that are pervasive in media 
saying to people, well, you know, we ought to, we ought to avoid factory farmed animals. So the issue of use is really not there. So people don't really under the, the issue of use is not being discussed. People don't really understand this. So if your friend, you know, educate your friends. Now, as Anna says, at some point in time, if your friends, you know, you educate your friends and they still keep making fun of you and they still keep at some point in time, you got to decide, you know, you want these people to be your friends or is it time to sort of get um, different friends? Uh, and, you know, and sometimes you just have to, you know, you make new relationships, you get rid of old ones. And sometimes, you know, you just have to sort of part company. Um, but I think it's really important. I think one of the things that I, one of the things that I see all the time is animal people frustrated because their friends and families don't see it, but is it any surprise they don't see it? I mean, is it any surprise that people don't get this? Because even people who care, even people, and I think a lot of people do care, but when they turn to the animal movement to see how they should implement their caring, what they're told is eat cage-free eggs, crate free pork, and send us a donation. So when you come along and say you shouldn't eat animals, it doesn't matter how, how, how they're treated, you shouldn't eat them. People think, wow, that's really radical. And the answer is no, it's not radical at all, actually. It follows directly from the idea that animals matter morally you can't eat them wear them and use them if they matter morally and they're not things you can't eat them wear them and use them that that's that it, it's really quite simple but however simple it is to me to anna to you and to many of the other people out there it's not simple to everybody else they're confused about it we need to help unconfuse them okay thanks for that we had a we had another question actually uh, uh, which i think you've actually answered it was it was about the difference between <laughs> This, this goes this goes on this goes on all day okay. there goes another leg <laughs> um yeah i say that we had another question related to the difference between sort of treatment use which i think you've uh, you've actually answered so we won't worry about too much about that one okay so <clears throat> here's a question from melissa who says do you have suggestions on how best to answer the question why did you become vegan especially when it comes up during an omni meal, which again, I think you partly answered just now. Often there are people who will ask only that question. So it's the only opportunity to educate or influence them. We all have personal stories in response, but from an advocacy perspective, what are your suggestions? That's a great question. Um, well, you know, you can answer that simply, or, you know, you can, you can actually tell them that your history. Um, and telling the story. But what I tend to do when people ask me that question, why are you vegan? Why did you become vegan? And um, I short circuit it and just sort of get to the point and say, well, you know, because it's the just thing to do. And if you say something provocative like that, people say, what do you mean just? And then you say, well, let's think about this for a second. You know, do you care about animals? Yes. Do you think they matter? Yes. Do you think they matter? You know, that, that they, they have moral status. Do you reject the idea that they're just things? Of course I do. Okay. Well, if they're not resources and they're not things, then how can we possibly justify treating them as resources, treating them as things, and eating them, wearing them, using them? It's really quite, I mean, it, it and, and so, you know, that's generally how I do it. I, I don't, I don't start launch into, slaughterhouses or, or, you know, I, I, I just, I just, I just focus people on a simple idea. Um, and you know, I think that that's a really effective way to do it, which is why I do it. But, um, you know, in the past couple of days, we've seen that, um, president Trump, uh, was going to, um, cancel the regulation or rescind the regulation, which prohibited, importing elephant parts into the United States. And this occasioned an outroar, an uproar rather, because people were really outraged because, you know, because the Trump children go and kill animals in, in Africa or wherever. And, um, and people have been talking about this. As a matter of fact, it's been on every single news show. And now Trump has put rescinding this thing on hold, you know, and he said, well, he's need, he needs to think about it more. But the reality is people care about animals. 
but they need to they need to have their care and their concern focused and directed. So people need to see that yeah, they can get outraged at at the Trump boys going to Africa and killing elephants, but that there's something really wrong with the fact that they're sitting there stuffing their faces with their chicken and their hamburgers and their fish and their dairy and their eggs while they're while they're, you know, complaining about what the Trump boys do. And um, that there's no difference between the chicken that you're eating and the the elephant that you know the 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 the, the Trumps have killed in Africa. Um, you know, uh, I once wrote an essay saying, you know, an elephant may weigh more than a chicken, but not morally, or something something like that. Uh, that sounds yeah. a little bit. That sounds a little clunky as a title. When, when it when it, I think I think it was when when it when it comes to uh, matters of molarity. Uh, they both weigh the same. I think is what you said. Something, okay. something like those ones. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and I remember the poster. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There you go. Um, and so I, I, I really do think that um, that you know uh, that's a, an effective way to do it because anybody who's who's interested in animals, who's talking with you on this issue, even mildly interested, these are people who have dogs, they have cats, they have you know they have they like animals. And what you you know what I what I love to do is focus them on some story because there's always a story whether it's the Trumps you know killing elephants or whether it's a dentist from Minnesota who goes and kills Cecil the lion or whether it's you know the Tai Chi uh, dolphins or whether it's you know whatever it is there's always some story in the news and people are focused on it and that's a really good hook to use so you know you just sort of focus people well do you think what they did was wrong yeah well why are you why is what you're doing any different and you know what i've started great conversations that way and and it really and and because you're not sort of saying you know you're not starting off the conversation by saying by the way i think you're a nazi or i think you know you're the same as a slave owner um you can actually sort of get the people into the conversation uh without totally alienating them Sure. What uh, I, I think the um, again, you've touched on something. This, I, I mean, I totally agree with your stance on, on, on dealing it as a, as a moral issue. But a lot of people, a lot of people say that that's kind of been a little bit radical, and we have to sort of sneak up on people with, you know, talking about compassion and and not being cruel and dealing with abuse and this kind of thing. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, do you? Do you I mean, why, why is it? I wonder why people think so much that. Um, that people you're talking to just can't seem to understand what is basically a very simple concept. It's funny you asked that question because I woke up this morning and I was thinking of a post I was going to make, which I didn't make, which I will make when the webinar is over, about, because people always ask me, why do I bristle so much at the expression compassion? Um, and and the the answer to that question is, I don't compassion and mercy and and all and kindness and all this stuff. That's about feelings, and I'm not not really interested. I mean, I know it's 2017, and all we care about is feelings, and feelings are great. I mean, it's wonderful to have. You know, emotions are essential for 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 moral behavior, um, but they don't tell the whole story. And in my, in my judgment, they don't tell the most important part of the story, which is principle, and and there are principles of justice. And I, I want to I want to show you this is this is our this is our uh, this is our this is our smallest dog. And she is she's she's the boss. She's the boss. She is the top dog. They all are terrified of her, including all, all the dogs are all of whom are bigger than she is. And she was recently at the groomers and, and they cut her a little short and she's been cold. So we got she has only have clothes. She, 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 yeah. So she has a little thing and it says leader on the back <laughs> um which which is actually no 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 oh gosh which is uh Lucy, there you go where's mine i don't know there we go yeah, yeah, okay yeah. there we go <laughs> which is actually very accurate but um but you know I, I, the reason why i don't like compassion as a concept oh no <laughs> is the okay. reason i don't like compassion as a concept is because I don't really care. You know, it's like, would we talk about compassion if we were talking? I mean, um, you know, <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. Um, okay. When, if we were talking about slavery 
or you know, I mean, that's a that's a that's a a, a good a good example. This morning there was a news story about um, about some uh, they found some human slavery. I mean, human slavery is actually a big problem in the world, but they they were finding some people in where was it, Anna? In Lib- Libya. I think it was Libya, where they were selling people for four hundred dollars or something like that, and um, and uh, you know, now that's wrong. That's unjust. That that that's 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 simply morally wrong. It's outrageous. It doesn't depend on having compassion for those people. It's a matter of justice. You could it, your emotional response or your your feelings about those people is really sort of irrelevant. Um, it, what's relevant is that that fundamental principle of justice is being violated. It's morally wrong, and so what what. Um, troubles me about compassion is it suggests that the idea that the that how we should act with respect to animals depends on our feelings our personal feelings whether we're compassionate and i think it's also i mean compassionate is not always used in that in that that definition but i think in the animal um context compassion seems to be along the lines of mercy in that right you're it's up to you to extend um, something good to people who are not similarly situated to you. The power structure really to me isn't changed when we're talking about compassion and mercy. It's like, oh, it's good of me to recognize that what I'm doing is hurting another creature. So I'll, I'll act nicely. It's sort of a noblesse oblige analogy, uh, you know, analog. Um, okay. So I don't think it changes the structure and it's much more within the treatment paradigm than it is the use paradigm, because if animals are not being totally controlled as property, where we have the last say about about how we use them, then mercy and compassion and stuff really don't operate in the same way. And, and, and you know, it, you frequently hear animal people say, well, you don't have to be a vegan as long as you're a compassionate person. And the right. answer is, if you're not a vegan, I don't really care about your level of compassion because it is um, nonsense. It's not. It's complete nonsense. If you say I'm a compassionate person, but I'm not a vegan, what that basically means is I care, but not enough to do the right thing. And I'm giving okay. myself an excuse and I'm patting myself on the back. All right. Thanks for that. I'm just as happy with that one. Okay, we've got loads and loads of great questions, so we'll uh, we'll start wading through them. Uh, this one comes from Nagaraj, and I um, apologise if I mispronounce your name. Um, do you have any advice for my vegan son in middle school, who is sometimes the subject of ridicule amongst his friends? Well, 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 that's tough. Um, that's a great question. Uh, I think, you know... Um, it's been a long time since I've been in middle school, um, and it, it was before electricity. But I think um, I think that um, you know, kids, uh, young young kids, um, always sort of pick on kids who have, you know, who are who are different, and um, you know, I think. Uh, and that's and it's hard. The thing of it is, is that it's it's harder for kids than it is. You know, if you're talking with an adult about how to deal with their friends who are not vegan, you know, you're talking about about um, you know older people who have a different sort of sense. But and it's harder, I think, for young kids. But I think what I would do um, is, you know, I would I would try to 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 explain to my child that. Um, when you take a moral position, whether it's about animals or whether it's about human rights issues, you're always going to get other kids making fun of you. And um, and you have to decide whether or not, you know, you're going to um, give up on your moral principles or, or weaken them or not express them um, so that you can fit in. And I think that in many ways, such a discussion is really sort of no different from anything else you would tell a child about. You're going to be confronted with lots of things and you're going to have to make a decision. Do you opt in or do you opt out? 
and not just about animals, but about lots of other stuff. And, um, and that if you opt out, uh, you might get some pushback from your friends, but, um, but two things, one, you have to decide, you know, you have to choose your friends, but secondly, um, that if the child cares about this issue, which I suppose is, is, is a given because we wouldn't be having the question if the child didn't care about the issue, that the best thing to do is to help educate the child so that the child can educate his or her friends in simple ways. I mean, again, I, I, I think that the basic education that gets us to an abolitionist position is something that you can explain to a 10 year old child. It really is a simple idea. Um, and, and I think, it, you know, you can, you can teach your children um, these things. And we're actually, we were talking last night about um, possibly doing something along, you know, down the road about for children. Uh, we have a lot of abolitionists um, who, who are interested in this issue about how to, how to deal with children and how to, you know, how to, how to, um, how to educate children. And, and, um, and I think that that's really important. And so, um, you know, we will probably do something. We have a new book coming out and, um, uh, I hope it's going to be very soon and it's called advocate for animals and a big exclamation point you advocate for animals. Um, and, um, uh, and that's that's you know I mean I think a lot of it is applicable to children, but it's basically a general book about how we should advocate and about various situations, you know about about where to advocate, what to advocate, and things. But but well, I think also at the back of Eat Like You Care, you know, we did um, a section with answers to the most common prob um, right. questions you get or silly comments that you get, and um, I'm sure this that your child in school is going to be getting some of those answers. So it might be a supportive thing for you to do to look at uh, some of those questions and answers and talk through them with your child. I mean, even rehearse it. Um, we need to be ready for those sorts of, of situations. So I think that could be a supportive moment for you as a family, but also can give them some ammunition to, to um, brush off uh, any you know silly comments that they're getting in school. You know, really, as I say, the uh, the the um, the basic ideas of abolition are really quite simple, and um, and and I, I really think if you understand them, you should be able to explain them to a child. Um, you know, I often tell my students, if you want to know whether or not you understand a concept, you you see if you can explain it to your you know, your, your sister or brother, you know, uh, your younger sister or brother, who's a kid. And if you can't, you probably don't understand the concept. And if you do, if you can't explain it to, to the, to your younger sibling, you probably do understand the concept because, you know, I don't care whether it's abolition, quantum theory, or calculus. If you understand the basic ideas, you should be able to explain it to, you know, a, 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 mo a child who wants to learn, you know, who is motivated to learn. So, you sure. know, uh, but. Okay. Thanks. I think it's so, I think it's also important that the person who's being ridiculed is if they, sh if they show their, their friends that they're serious about it and they're consistent about it, I think that eventually they get respect and the ridiculing stops. Absolutely. Um, so, so that's important for, for yeah. Navarro's son to, to appreciate that too. Okay. I think you're going to like this next one. It's got one of your favorite words in it. What are the professor's opinions? This is from Mary, by the way. Sorry, Mary. What are the professor's opinions of militant vegans who shame or even worse, attack non vegans? Shouldn't we show respect to everyone's journey uh, towards a more con conscious being? It took us all some time to get there. Shouldn't we allow such time for others? Mary, if I could banish the word journey from the English language, I would do so. Um, Let's think about this for a second. Let's imagine I grow up in Mississippi in 1945, really racist place. Uh, probably not all, well, probably still somewhere, right? the whole country's still racist, but, but you know, pre-civil rights, Southern, Southern pre-civil rights time. Um, and I grow up a racist and then I get to be 20 years old and I realize that, my God, racism is horrible. It's immoral, it's unjust. Um, should I then say, well, gee, it took me 20 years to realize that racism is a bad thing. So therefore, I should respect everybody's journey 
and not demand racial equality? Uh, and the answer is, of course, we would never, ever say anything like that. Um, we would say race, ra racism is wrong. And the fact that it took me 20 years to stop being a racist, shame on me for taking so long, but it doesn't mean it's okay for somebody else to take 20 years, you know, that, that there's no right or wrong about it. It's just a matter of journey. I see this whole journey nonsense um, in the same way that I see the compassion nonsense, that it's a focus on me. You know, it's my feeling, my compassion, my mercy, my journey. Got nothing to do with your journey, Mary. It's got to do with their rights, and and so I to, to when we when we when we say talk about militant vegans, I actually uh, find that really troubling, um, because I agree that going up to people and screaming at them um, is a really bad idea, or you know uh, some of these antics that some of these groups do, you know these street theater groups are going into restaurants and you know, screaming at people who are eating animal products. I think that's a really bad idea for lots of reasons. But I also think that um, if animals matter morally and it's immoral to exploit them, we need to be clear about that. And the fact that it took me, I was in my 20s before I became a vegan. And, um, and, 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 you know what? Shame on me. I should have realized it sooner. Of course, there was like I'd never I never even heard the word, word vegan before I became one uh, 35 years ago. Uh, I, had, I had never heard the word vegan. But um, but but, uh, you know, I ate animal products for, you know, the first couple of decades of my life. That doesn't mean it was OK. That doesn't mean that I was on a journey that made it OK. I was doing something morally wrong. And then one day I came to see that it was morally wrong. and I stopped doing it. Um, so this idea that, well, because it took me some time to get there means everybody else ought to take time to get there. The answer is once you get once you realize racism is wrong, you're clear that racism is wrong and, and you should take the position that racism is wrong. Once you once you get to the point where you see sexism is wrong, misogyny is wrong, then it's wrong and you ought not to promote it. And you ought to be clear that it's morally wrong. This idea that, you know, that that. Well, we realize, you know, I realize that eating animals is wrong, but because you don't realize eating animals is wrong, you're on a journey. The answer is that's moral relativism. And I think that that is that I, I reject that completely. So um, if, if eating animals, wearing animals, using animals is morally wrong, we ought to be clear about that. And we ought always we ought always to be clear about that. That doesn't mean we yell at people. It doesn't mean we judge people it means we're clear yeah. about actions i mean uh, mary's probably heard that from people I'm, I'm sure it's not her position or else it's unlikely she'd be on this webinar so um but you know if we pass at, pass out that um, sentence a little bit is that i agree that um being a mil if, if militant is being you know in someone's face and yelling and not really engaging and explaining yourself then that's not education anyway so i'm happy to completely discard that i think it's i think it's ineffective i think it's the wrong thing to do so i'm not a militant vegan like that i'm a consistent one so if militant you know if consistent morphs into militant because you can't shake me from that then i'm going to to be the, I'm going to plug consistent vegan into that question. But also the shaming question is, um, I'm not a big participant on, on social media because I don't like a lot of the atmosphere on it. And there is a lot of bullying and, and inappropriate um, positions and approaches being taken on it. But not every um, idea that, that you reject because you're not comfortable with it yet is a, an attempt to shame you so if someone is saying what you believe already means that you should be a vegan you already know that and you just haven't done it that's not shaming somebody that's that's repeating the consistent uh, point then you step in in a supportive way and help them do it if there's some barrier to to to, to them becoming vegan then send them to the how do i go vegan site 
uh, with simple um, ways to adjust to a different lifestyle. Tell them how to make their own cheap cleaners so they're not spending seven seven dollars on a spray thing, you know, and they think they can't do that because it's too expensive. Do all the things that that you've done when you made the you tweaked your life to make those adjustments to a fully vegan li um, life. Um, but it, it doesn't mean that because they're not where you are and where you would like them to be, you're going to water down the message. You give them a consistent message and they'll get there, hopefully sooner rather than later, or unfortunately when they're ready. But we don't change the message. We are consistent vegans. And if they want to call us militant vegans, it's usually because they know that they're not doing the right thing. You know, the, the, this... This whole thing, this this whole way of approaching it is really very speciesist because, you know, if 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 I were to have a, if I was talking with someone who said, you know, and I was saying, you know, I'm really concerned about uh, racism in the United States because it's quite horrible. Um, and and somebody said, well, you know, I'm a racist and you're shaming me. The answer is no, you're a racist and I'm telling you racism is wrong. And let's talk about that. And let's let's I'm happy to discuss with you why. Uh, racism is immoral and unjust, but um, this idea that just because somebody disagrees with you know because you confront someone with a moral principle and they they don't know how to resolve they don't know how to respond to it and they say you're shaming me, this is this sort of thinking is corrosive and it is destroying. Um, I, I think it's actually destroying civilization because what it's doing is it's it's. Um, it's rejecting moral realism. So everything, you know, everything's just a matter of feelings. It's a matter of opinion. It's a if that's what if that's where we are, then um, we're in a mess. And um, you know, if we if we if we can't say if, if 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 we can't say racism is wrong, sexism is wrong, anti-Semitism is wrong, um, you know, the Holocaust was a really horrible thing. If we can't say those things, and say it's also wrong to victimize the vulnerable in terms of what we do to non-human animals. If, 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 if taking a position on those sorts of fundamental rights violations shames people, shame on them. Okay, thanks for that. I think Anna's also addressed the, uh, the, uh, the position that we hear quite a lot, uh, and that is that um, taking an unequivocal approach to, to vegan education is an all or nothing scenario where we say go vegan or don't do anything which of course we know is we know is completely untrue i mean what we do is say uh please go vegan and uh, as you often say if people are uh, going to do something else then that's their choice right. um and we can encourage them obviously but we're, we're not going to um advocate anything anything less but people's people who want to uh, uh who want to be derogatory we say what we're, we're saying oh go vegan or don't do anything which of course is ridiculous so there we go Okay, another question then. We've got lots here from Suzanne, who says, sometimes it seems to be especially difficult to convince young, intelligent, well-educated people. Some are asking for evidence that the abolitionist approach is effective, asking for evidence that the foot-in-the-door approach is better than the door-in-the-face technique. Okay. To me, it seems obvious. We're not trying to sell something. We're discussing moral matters, but they doubt. Do you know of any research that could be cited? Well, I mean, the problem is, is that um, I, I, you know, I, I don't even know how you would design the, the problem. I mean, we're talking about fundamental rights violations. Does anybody ever ask for empirical? I mean, ha has anyone ever asked you, Suzanne? And I'm asking. I'm sure you don't agree. I'm just saying. Has, has anyone ever asked the question? Um, you know. Do you have an empirical study to show that saying that racism is wrong is more effective than having racist joke free Monday as a as a way of getting rid of 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 racism? Or um, has anyone ever said, is there an empirical study which shows that uh, rejecting uh, sexism as wrong, unequivocally wrong, is uh, more effective or less effective than gentle sexism or misogyny before six or something like that. 
And the answer is no, no one ever asks that question when we're talking about fundamental human rights. No one ever says, is there an empirical study that shows that taking a position about, about fundamental rights is more effective than, um, than, than not taking a, a position on fundamental rights? And the answer is no, no one, I mean, I've never, ever, no one's ever said to me, gee, you know, um, we think racism is wrong, but maybe we ought to have gentle racism. And are there, are there empirical studies that show that gentle racism is a good thing and a better way of, of getting people to not be racist? And the answer is no, nobody ever talks that way. It's only when we talk about animals. Now, why do we do this? We do this because these animal groups who are nothing but businesses, and what they do is their stock and trade is selling out animals. I don't care whether it's Mercy for Animals, whether it's HSUS, PETA, Compassion Over Killing, all of them. That all they are, they're there to make money selling out animal interests. So they're basically promoting happy exploitation. And they've got people into the, into the, the head of thinking that, well, maybe it's better to to promote happy exploitation than it is to promote no exploitation. Maybe it's, quote, more effective. And the answer is, I, I, I don't even accept the, the premise. I don't accept the premise. Um, and and the, the supposed studies that these people have that you see that comes out of the Humane League and, and, and um, you know, all of these, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, um, uh, What's the other uh, phonolytics and um, there's some other, some of these other groups. They 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 supposedly have empirical evidence that people are more likely to go vegan if you tell them not to go vegan. The studies that they rely on are nonsense. Their empirical data and their analyses are ridiculous. But the bottom line is there's a fundamental question we're avoiding here, which is where fundamental rights are involved where human rights are involved, we never, ever ask that question. And the fact that we do so in the animal context is itself an indication that we bought into speciesism. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And we also have, um, we haven't done a study on it, um, but, you know, abolitionist vegan advocacy is still in its early days. Um, we haven't had this approach uh, on, a, on a large scale ever so we have centuries of expressed concern for animals i mean millennia in some in some instances and it ha and it hasn't moved the situation forward very much and we're probably in a situation where more animals are, are treated worse than at any time in history so we know that the welfare single issue campaign stuff has not worked um, there are thousands of people um, talking to each other on the abolitionist approach site and web, uh, Facebook page who are saying, hey, this works. I can do this myself and this works. So <clears throat> I'm going to keep encouraging everybody to do it um, and see, have the direct individual experience of it working. I don't really care what those studies say. I haven't even read them life being short, I'm not going to apply myself to read those things because um, like anything else, it depends who um, asks for the study to be done, who funds it and who um, interprets the results. So <clears throat> the, um, as a matter of fact, the, the font, the big phonolytics, the, the supposed big phonolytics study, which, which they concluded show shows, it showed that, um, that, that, uh, that a lot of people were not, you know, who, who were, ve you know, who, who were vegan or vegetarian lapsed back into non-veganism or non-vegetarianism or whatever. What they didn't point out was the people who were most likely to stay vegan were the people who were vegan for moral reasons. And so, you know, I mean, I, I think this, this industry of empirical data that you see coming out of, of, um, 
of uh, of phonolytics and the humane uh, humane league lab or whatever. Humane league, yeah. yeah, these are nothing but um, uh, uh, welfareist organizations which are coming up with welfareist nonsense pseudoscience pseudo statistics and basically to, to bolster the welfareist case. The bottom line is, as Anna said, we've had we've had animal welfare for over 200 years now. We're exploiting more animals now in more horrific ways than ever. And there, anybody who believes that um, animal welfare reform or single issue campaign. No, oh, we've uh, we've lost Gary and Anna for, for the moment. So I'm sure glitch on uh, on Gary's computer end. Sorry about this. Probably a recurrence of what happened before. But Gary's just logging back in now, so hopefully in a few seconds we'll be uh, we'll be back. So we just got one or two one or two comments. I'll, I'll read to you. Um, while we wait for Gary and Anna. This is from Tara says, Gary, your work made me vegan after 20 plus years of being a vegetarian. Thanks for helping me make the change. Now my wife is vegan too. Well, that's terrific. Uh, that's okay. Ah, right. Okay, we're back. Hooray. Hello. <laughs> oh, this is fun, isn't it? <laughs> I think we need, I think we need new, so I think we need new software. I think, I think we need right. to complain to the people at webinar. Do yeah. You? Okay. So let's go on to the next question. This is uh, from Catherine Beach. Does anyone have any recommendations for good journals, academic publishing on the effectiveness of abolitionist advocacy versus incremental personal advocacy? Or, sorry, incremental personal journey focused or happy exploitation welfareist methodology. The argument for welfareism and a reduction is often that getting people to do anything is better than scaring them off with the extreme, extremes of veganism and getting them to ignore you. But we know this is obviously not right. I was wondering if anyone has seen studies proving this. I think you've largely covered this one already, yeah, haven't you? There are, there are, yeah. uh, you? If you want, you want, you want to, you want to, you want to check the. If you want to ascertain the effectiveness of of the incremental approach, all you need to do to test that is go outside and look and pay attention, mm -hmm. and you'll see it ain't working. Um, as a matter of fact, I think actually things are much worse than they were in the 19, in the later 1980s. Uh, I think there was much more, much more um, focus on the issue in the early 90s uh, than there is now. Now we've we've lapsed into a happy exploitation movement. This idea that you know getting people to do something. What what does that mean? Um, you know, getting them to, to do something. To do what? To buy cage-free eggs? To buy crate-free pork? To be vegan before six? To have meatless Mondays? What does this do? I mean, even if even if people do those things, what is what is the effect of that? The number. I mean, we're exploiting more animals now in more horrific ways than any point any point in human history. And I actually have more. <clears throat> Um, I'll use the word faith in people than, than is behind this question because it's um, I, I hear that point often made and I think what am I seeing behind this conversation and essentially it seems to me that it's the person saying well it's, it was fine for me I get it I understand it aren't I great but other people can't and there's a sort of setting yourself up as being better or more moral or more able to understand things. I mean, the, the person who asked a, a question a couple of times ago was talking about, well, I'm dealing with, you know, highly educated academic young people. Having spent most of my life around a university, I, I know that universities are not necessarily the best place um, to, to find uh, immoral ideas really taking root. <clears throat> and I think if you'll find in, if you do abolitionist vegan education, you'll be surprised that um, the quote, ordinary people understand this. And if it's not presented as something extreme, I mean, you're characterizing, you're, you're defining it as being difficult if it's extreme or something. No, it's not, it's consistent veganism. And, um, you know, there are, there are people who um, are working very hard um, 
participating on the abolition to approach page and how do I go vegan website who are, are really making sure that people can understand that it doesn't have to change your life except in good ways that you know you won't be out there grinding your own corn and cooking all weekend right now I'm actually not cooking there's nothing on the stove because it's quite easy to to feed yourself and your family without being in the kitchen all day you don't have to change everything we're not big into cooking but we don't you, you know. don't it's it's but that if if it did ch require more i'd still say that we had to do it but it is easy for the vast number of people but it's easy to make the decision um you know we might have to make small adjustments and think about doing something in, a, in an unfamiliar way but heaven knows we need to be as a society taking strong moral stands on many more things than we are i'm uh, don't know what time people will be uh, looking at the tape of this if we post the tape, but um, people are probably familiar that in the United States, the question of sexism and harassment, particularly in the workplace, is coming to a head in a way that I find encouraging and a way that I think might stick this time. It, it feels different, the discussion. But okay. that's going to require that people um, <coughs> look at their own behavior. So I think we can ask a little bit more of everybody um, because we're, we're not the only ethical ones. Other people can, can rise to this occasion, too. Absolutely. And that's the way you, with the expectation of of communicating and having a good result is the way that abolitionist education works. And, and look, let, let me explain. Something. We don't need to do this. Um, you know, we do this because we believe in it. It's not our business. It's it's not you know, we don't have an organization. Um, and, you know, we both have our own jobs and we don't need to do this. Um, and the reason why we do it is because we know it's effective. It works. It's the right thing to do, but it also works. I mean, the number of people we have turned on to veganism has been extraordinary. The number of people who have written to us saying, I've been a vegetarian for decades, never became a vegan until I came to your work. I've been involved with this group, that group, this group, that group. Well, Alan just read a comment yeah. while we were having the technical problems, you know, so on a 20 year, mm. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. vegetarian. And yeah. so uh, cause usually because nobody's asked them with the expectation that it's going to have an effect to be vegan. The no people pushed a little bit. The people who promote this idea that we need to have empirical evidence to show that abolition is, is more effective than the, incremental baby steps approach are all people involved in these large corporate charities that are in the business of selling happy exploitation. And I mean, think about it. Just think about the logic of it. Is it likely you're going to get people to go vegan by telling them that they can do anything but be vegan and still discharge their obligations, their moral obligations to animals. If you tell people, you don't have to be vegan, just be compassionate consumers. You think they're ever gonna be vegan? And the answer is no. So, I mean, if you tell people that they can discharge their moral obligations to animals by not being vegan, then they ain't gonna be vegan. And <laughs> you, can, you can pretty much rest assured, be rested, you can rest assured of that. So I, I think it's really, it, you know, it's really sort of important to sort of, you know, I mean, I reject that whole way of thinking because we would never apply that in the human context. We would never ask for empirical evidence uh, as to whether or not gentle sexism or, or reduced misogyny or reduced racism was more effective than taking principled positions. We would never, ever do that, but we do it where animals are concerned. That species is. We have to shake the whole issue away from it being just a casual consumer choice right i mean all too many times i don't know if, if people listening have had this experience <clears throat> you talk about um in, about a, a vegan lifestyle and particularly um a vegan diet and people will say oh are you gluten free too it's like as if those are <laughs> those are similar considerations mm -hmm. i mean if you have a health issue yes address it but it you know deciding to get to, to go vegan and choosing gluten-free bread are not are not the same thing and it's a shame that it's degenerated into this casual consumer choice stuff this is this is something very very serious and that's that's the message of abolitionist vegan education not extreme but consistent <clears throat> okay thank you for that um uh, i'll say that's uh, 
that, I'll, I'll go the, the name of this next question along with that question, which is a bit odd, but never mind. So this is definitely from Catherine Besch, and I've not seen this one before. It's quite an interesting one. For those of us working and living in developing countries uh, with food insecurity, United Nations organisations like the FAO say that poverty reduction is tied to animal agriculture. In Vietnam, where I think Catherine lives, everyone in my neighbourhood has farm animals. Advocating for veganism can be difficult, particularly in a flood-prone area where crops are routinely wiped out during monsoons, although roughly 70,000 livestock have been killed in the recent deadly typhoon. What advice can you offer for this situation? The livelihoods argument is thrown around often around the world, so probably a lot of us might relate to this issue. Right. Well, it's um, interesting to actually have a question from someone who is <clears throat> living in... Um a country where the question is not usually posed from. By the way, hi, Catherine, because Catherine's on our page and she's a, she's a participant. Ah. Yeah. I usually get the um, food insecurity f uh, question from people who are not facing food insecurity and who are living, you know, on the East Coast of the United States where um, <clears throat> with, uh, with con usual conveniences and, and access to food. So um, <clears throat> it's, you know, things are hard in Myanmar, so what do I do in New Jersey? So I understand, I appreciate a question that isn't just a dodge. I mean, local local conditions can complicate things. I have never even set foot in Vietnam, so I'm not going to presume to talk about the problem. My government tried to send me to Vietnam yeah. <laughs> right. several decades ago, but I resisted <laughs> that. Forcefully, right? Yeah. But, but, uh, How was Sing Sing anyway? <laughs> right. So I can understand there are there are certainly different challenges. Um, but a lot of the um, problems of geography and weather are also complicated by the cultural elements that are important there. So if people have grown up with um, animal foods, then we've, we've constructed a society where they can be produced and um, where the considerations uh, take animal use as a given. You know, we, we're going to use animals, so this is how we're going to live. So I'm sure that if if we're going to um, a vegan diet, then the solutions, because we're going to need solutions uh, for agriculture because of climate change and uh, population pressure, we need to integrate the importance of veganism into those solutions. Um, how you deal with people on, you know, in your neighborhood who have got farm animals, it's it's tough in terms of, of livelihood. Um, uh, I don't know. I guess I guess people are going to have to organize and look at it with a different perspective. Many of the um, problems, though, are problems because we accept the use of animals as part of the discussion that's on the table before anything else is presented as, as a solution. And, and it's also it's also the case that because we exploit third world nations, I mean, we've got situations where crops are being grown in countries that are then being used to feed animals that are being consumed by people in the West, where the people who actually are in the countries where those crops are growing are starving, don't have enough food. Um, I mean, you know, the, the, the reality is if we were all vegan, there'd be enough food to feed everybody in the world. Um, there's no doubt about that. I mean, the, the amount of plants that we, that we feed to animals in this country alone, the United States alone, could feed almost 800 million people. These are crops that we're feeding to animals. If they were fed directly to humans, we could be talking about feeding 800 million people. So, you know, the, the problem is not, um, is not food. The problem is how food is distributed. And the problem is how we exploit third world nations. Um, and, um, and, and, and animal agriculture has, has a big role in that. Um, you know, but as Anna says, you know, it's, it's, at least we're getting the question from Catherine who lives in Vietnam. The really, the really annoying thing is, is when you're having dinner with somebody on the Upper West Side in Manhattan and they're concerned about, you know, well, what would I do if I were, you know, in a, you know, in a barren place in Africa? And the answer is you're not, you're sitting on 72nd Street in Manhattan. Um, and, and um, you know, and, and I think that a lot of, I mean, it, it's really terrible. Um, you know, I've, I was reading recently, uh, particularly about Africa and about the, the, the uh, 
the number uh, the, the amount of plant material that is raised there to feed to animals that are going to be consumed by um, more privileged people to the, you know, and, and to the detriment of, of people who are poor. Um, but, you know, there's, there's no, look, there are going to be tough, there are going to be tough situations um, where there are going to be difficult questions. But part of the issue is to unpack those questions and to see where the source of the poverty is. And, um, and almost always, it's a distributional problem. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I don't deny that there may be some circumstance where somebody is on a desert island and they either have to eat an animal or die. But there are circumstances where people are on a desert island and only with another human being and, you know, they kill and eat the other human being. Doesn't make it right, but we understand in situations, there are situations in which there is no choice. But in many cases, in, in almost all cases, there are choices. And in almost all cases where there appear to be no choices, um, if you look behind the situation, you find that there are all sorts of injustices going on that created the situation of, of uh, that, that, that created the situation in the first place that need to be undone. Okay, well, Catherine, thanks, um, thanks for that uh, question. I hope that uh, the answer is uh, is, is uh, satisfied. Also, I mean, also again, local uh, circumstances I'm not familiar with, but. There has been um, sort of culture creep um, from the West um, into um, countries that have not traditionally relied on animal foods so strongly. You know, we're now at the point where India is one of the biggest producers Absolutely. Of, of cows. And China. Well, and chi in, uh, India and chi China. India and China. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a shift with because people think of animal foods often um, identify it with affluence and. Um, and uh, you know, uh, greater um, economic uh, development. So, if we can break that identification as cultures change, that's a very important thing to do. And I'm sure vegan act activists on the ground in other countries like Vietnam and other parts, particularly of Southeast Asia, um, need to be uh, focusing on the on the very very strong plant based tradition um, in their um, traditional cuisine. You know, and, and, and it's, it's, it's Western creep that is causing a lot of this. And of course, global you know, warming isn't helping either. Um, so the, the, uh, the animal injection, I'm so sorry, that's, it's very inconvenient with this. Um, the injection of animals into those societies are probably causing a hell of a lot of trouble generally. And it's not, it's not something that's always been the case. So, um, I, I'm hoping the development will, will take ethics into consideration. And, you know, okay. technological, technological innovations um, can help. I mean, a, a big part, of, a, a significant problem, and a problem is going to get worse, is the problem of climate change. Because climate change is, is it, it's, it's astonishing to me that people aren't more frightened of what, of what global warming is doing. Um, because it's becoming pretty clear that it is, um, it's not a problem of the future, it's a problem of now. And it's affecting a lot of places all over the world. It's only going to get worse. Um, and it's sort of astonishing to me that people are more alarmed about this because it, it, um, it, is, it is every bit as, um, as threatening as a pandemic or you know something. I mean, it's, it's, it's a serious, serious issue. Um, largely, by the way, linked to animal agriculture, not exclusively to animal agriculture, but largely to animal agriculture. And um, if we were all vegans, um, it would be, it, you know, we would be generating much less, uh, uh, many fewer greenhouse gases. But, um, but uh, you know, so I think that, you know, we're going to have to confront global warming. But um, we also, you know, in a lot of poor places, um, people aren't really all that interested in helping, you know, in applying technology or providing technology so that people can grow plant products more effectively in their environment. So, you know, but the, but the reality, you know, the, the bottom line is animal agriculture is morally wrong. Um, and, and it doesn't matter where it's happening. It's morally wrong. It's not a matter of cultural relativism. It's a matter of it's wrong. And wherever it's occurring, 
I'm quite confident there can be a solution. And I'm also quite confident if most, if not substantially all the situations, um, uh, unjust economic practices and resource distribution patterns are at issue and at, at fault and, and the cause of the problem. Okay, thank you. Um, off on a completely different tack now from Melina, who says, how to deal with the emotional fatigue, the feeling that the sufferings of all these sentient beings continue and sometimes it seems there is no hope. Holidays are becoming depressing for me, thinking about all the turkeys, pigs, etc., etc., that will be killed to satisfy human palate pleasure. Holidays are no different from any other time. It's going on every single day, every single minute, every single, you know, I mean, at the, we actually deal with this issue in the book. Um, at the end of the book, we address, you know, the question we get a lot. How, how come, how do you avoid burning out? And, you know, we've been doing this for 35, 36 years now. And um, the bottom line is, and the, the short answer to that question is, we don't have rights to burn out. We're not the ones who are in the holding pens right now waiting for Monday morning where we're going to be slaughtered. Uh, we're not the ones in the labs. We're not, you know, the animals running around the woods that are wounded but not killed by hunters who didn't, you know, didn't hit them uh, in, a, in a fatal way. Um, we're not the animals who are suffering. We're trying to do something for them. I don't believe, I mean, I do this every single day. And you know what? I have to tell you, I consider it a privilege. I really do. I consider it, I'm very, I, I feel very fortunate to see things this way. And I want to share it with everybody else because I think it's the right way. Uh, I think it's the right way to think about the issues. And um, I don't think that I've got the right to burn out. You know, that's not, it's like, again, this is, you know, we're living at a time when everything is like so, selfie focused you know it's like it's like my feelings my angry my anguish my suffering you know and the answer is not your suffering you know it's their suffering and and if you've got you know if you're privileged enough you know to to be able to you know you've got the the time and the resources and the abilities to sort of try to provide a solution then it's your obligation to provide the solution it's not your right to not, in my judgment, I mean, this is just, you know, this is my view. Um, and, um, and, but I, I, I honestly, I, you know, I don't even understand the question people say, well, you know, how do you deal with, you know, how, how do you deal with, the question I get asked a lot is compassion fatigue. You know, do you suffer from compassion fatigue? And I said, I don't suffer from anything having to do with the word compassion. <laughs> I refuse on principle to, to, to yeah, count. What, what an offensive idea. Yeah, yeah. What offense? I mean, in terms of everyone needs to take care of their own mental health, obviously. Um, I don't look at uh, videos of animal um, abuse or stress or torture or, or um, I don't look at slaughterhouse videos or something. I know about it. I've seen a lot of it. I don't need to see any more. I don't need it as a kick in the pants to keep um, to, to ensure that I'm a consistent vegan. It, it's there. It's it's lodged in there. It will never come out. So I don't need to look at it. Now, I, th I think often the groups that are raising money and keeping themselves going through the single issue campaigns want you to engage the, with a horrifying video because that opens your wallet um, to, co to uh, contribute to whatever they're raising money to stop whatever tinkering they're, they're suggesting today. So I, I don't do that. I don't need to do it. It's a waste of time, but it's also an element of self-preservation. So I would encourage you to do that. Um, I, so you're not thinking, in, you know that the, a massive slaughter of turkeys is coming in, in some countries in the next six weeks or whatever. Um, but, but turkeys are being slaughtered all the time. All the time. And all go time. and think about something else. So you're, you're not thinking about it. Go and do something. Because the, the idea that you can do something is, I think, refreshing and heartening and strengthening. And you can do something. You can't stop all that slaughter, but you can have an effect through abolitionist vegan education um, to move the situation forward a little bit. And one thing I find most heartening about individuals going going and trying to make a difference on this issue is it's one of the few areas where you can change something we've said this before is that we individually have very little impact on foreign policy 
on all the bad things that come out of the way that um, the people um, in power rule, uh, you know, organize this planet. An awful lot of bad things are happening and you with your one vote, if you do vote, um, can feel very disheartened that it doesn't make a difference. And you have hope and you get someone else in office and they, they collapse into the same sort of person that you thought you were voting against. But on the vegan issue, you yourself in your own community, in your own family, in your own society, in your own workplace can make a difference. So the rest's going on. And, and believe me, <laughs> there is no hope of you changing most of it. But this we can have an impact on. I, I find that really heartening. Yeah. And look, they're killing a lot of turkeys and, you know, it's the holiday season and stuff. They kill a lot of turkeys all year long. They're killing a lot of animals all the time. What's depressing about this time of the year is because we have these two holidays, one in which we're giving thanks and one, one, one that we're celebrating the supposed birth of the Prince of Peace in which we engage in these violent rituals um, to give thanks and to celebrate peace. That's sort of distressing because it sort of indicates culturally and socially how confused we are. But, um, but as far as the animals are concerned, it doesn't matter. One day, one day is as good or bad as the rest in terms of, and they're all bad. Because, you know, they're, you know, whether they're killing a lot of turkeys now doesn't really matter because they're killing a lot of everything every day, you know. And so I wouldn't I wouldn't focus on that. But the thing I think is really important is don't I, my my in my view, don't don't give in to the idea that this is about you, because the moment you do that, then it's your suffering, your compassion, your journey, your this, your that got nothing to do with that. It's a question of justice. It's a question of what's right, what's wrong. And what we have an obligation to do. And if you've got the time and you've got the ability to go out there and, you know, if, if, if you're not, if you're not in a situation, I mean, even whatever situation you're in, you can be vegan. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's cheaper to be vegan than it is to have any other lifestyle um, in terms of what you eat and what you wear and whatnot. But, um, but, but if you have the time and the, the ability to actually spend time on this issue in terms of promoting it as a social justice issue, count yourself lucky and do it, you know, and don't, don't, don't not do it because you're, you're, you're suffering yourself. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, another question. Now this is a good one uh, from, well, they're all good, but this is, this is, I don't know, quite like this from myself. Uh, Thiago or Tiago, what do you think about the cube of truth street performances? In your opinion, is it a good way of promoting the abolitionist approach? I suppose no. it could be, would it be a good way? <laughs> no, no. Short answer, no. I, answer, I, no. Um, I mean, the street theater stuff is, I don't even understand. I mean, you got a bunch of people wearing a Guy Fox mask, which in and of itself is sort of interesting. Um, people don't realize Guy Fox was not an anarchist by any stretch of the imagination, but put aside Guy Fox for a second. But they're wearing their, their, their Guy Fox masks, standing in a, a cube or a square or whatever. And uh, they're, holding their, they're holding their laptops and they're, um, they're showing slaughterhouse scenes. Well, I've been doing this work for 35 years. One thing I can tell you is you show people slaughterhouse scenes and the first thing they think about is treatment. They say, oh, it's horrible. Got to do that in a more humane way. So that's, that's, that is one of the many reasons why I don't use that stuff in my advocacy. There are other reasons as well. But I don't use that sort of imagery in the advocacy that I do because I, I think that it naturally impels the mind to think about treatment issues and not about use issues. And number one. Number two, um, the, the groups that do, you know, the, 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 um, the, uh, un, uh, a group that, promotes this is by no means abolitionist. It promotes a lot of welfare stuff. It promotes a lot of single issue campaigns. Um, you know, we've had discussions on the abolitionist approach Facebook page about the whole cube of truth phenomenon. And we've had quite a bit of discussion about how it's not a clear message at all of veganism as a moral baseline. And, um, and we've seen instances, I mean, we've seen all sorts of instances where people who support this have no idea. I mean, they come, they say, oh, we're abolitionists. And then, you know, once you get them talking, they're promoting this, you know, this, this uh, uh, large corporate charity campaign or this single issue campaign or whatever. So they're totally confused about it. They're not abolitionists and they're not promoting veganism as a moral baseline. 
And so that's, I mean, so, so the message right from the beginning is, is, um, is problematic. I don't, you know, and, and this, this, the street theater stuff, um, it's gimmicky and it brands an organ, it brand, it's, it's used primarily, I don't care whether it's this group or whether, you know, there are some other groups that do these sorts of things. Um, and they're branding, you know, they, they, they have their events where they are wearing the same t-shirt and it's, a, it's, it really is, it's, it's about branding groups. It's not about getting a message out. And um, what I really firmly believe after doing this for almost four decades um, and, and having been involved, Anna and I were, have, were in the early days involved with some of these organizations, most particularly PETA. And having seen over the years that basically um, these, these groups are businesses and however, whatever intentions they start off with, those intentions get um, changed pretty quickly uh, because um, it becomes a business. And you end up thinking that, well, if you compromise your position, it'll bring in more money and then you'll be able to do more good for the animals. And then so by the time you're done, you start off with a really good idea and then you know, you end up, um, it really bothers me uh, that my uh, friend Ingrid Newkirk, um, you know, has a, ha, you know, is on the Bell and Evans chicken website promoting uh, you know, the, the humane, you know, the, the supposedly more humane chicken that is pr produced by Bell and Evans. And you can go, don't take my word for it. You have your, you, before you say, no, no, Peter would never do that. Go to the Bell and Evans website and you can see for yourself a nice big statement from Ingrid Newkirk about how Bell and Evans has really shown that good animal welfare and good business can go hand in hand. And, um, and that's what you end up with. What you end up with is you start off with a good idea that, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to really go after animal exploitation and you end up on the Bell and Evans website uh, promoting happy chicken because basically you, you make it, you know, you, you, you compromise because you believe that if you compromise, you can do more good. That is the, um, the source in my judgment of why we're in the moral mess that we're in because we do compromise on issues of fundamental uh, rights, particularly when it comes to animals, but also when it comes to humans. And we need to be more cl clear about, about you know, uh, we, we need to be moral, we need to get back our moral realism. We need to realize that, um, you know, there are certain things that are simply wrong. And to say that they're wrong is not a matter of opinion. It is a matter of moral fact. And um, we've gotten away from that. And I think that that's really troubling. But, um, but yeah, you know, I mean, the, the cube of truth, direct action everywhere, um, you know, these groups, they're, they're not radical groups, um, not at all. They're, they're base, these are basically um, new welfarist groups. They promote new welfarist agendas, but they do it, you know, with Guy Fawkes masks standing in a cube, or they do it, you know, going into a place and shouting at everybody or whatever DXE does. And, um, you know, uh, and, and, or, or, they, or they have a, or they have a, an event where they stand with a bunch of dead animals in their hands wearing coordinated t-shirts. This has to do with branding. It has to do with business. It has to do with bringing in donations. It does not have to do with changing the world. It does not have to do with getting people to focus on the basic issue of justice that animal use, however humane, is morally wrong. Okay, well, I think that's, uh, I think that's a no then. Uh, so another question, which I think might also be a no, um, well, it might be a yes, actually. Uh, this is from Gwen. I want to go to an anti-fur march. Is that bad since it focuses on just fur? Yes. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Thought it might be. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Gwen, what's the different? Look, what's the difference between fur? Her, this person's Gwen, G-W-E-N. Gwen, yeah. Yeah. Gwen, what's the difference between fur, leather, wool, silk? The answer is no different. They're all bad. And, um, and the, the, the anti-fur movement is, is absurd and it's sexist. It has been, I mean, w when I first got involved in this many, many years ago, fur was the big issue. It's still the big issue. And you know what? The only difference between then and now is the fur industry is much stronger now than it was then. Um, single issue campaigns don't work. And single issue campaigns are fundamentally problematic because what they involve is you have an anti-fur movement. The anti-fur movement is composed of a lot of people who think that fur is worse than wool and leather and other animal things and animal clothing. And, um, and, and so, so, you know, fur gets demonized. 
what's the difference between leather and fur fur is just leather that's got the, the hair still on it that's all um you know leather has got the the you know the fur scraped off what what's the difference and so you know um uh, I think it's a, a, a mistake. And also because, you know, fur is worn primarily by women and fur has historically been um, a campaign that has been used to, I, I, I remember uh, when I was a young lawyer. I, Chinese yeah, and I used to, I used to go and represent that people. That situation had everything. Yeah, yeah. And Racism, I, misogyny. Exactly, exactly. And, and I, I remember the first, one of the first things I ever did when I was a young lawyer is I went and represented a bunch of people who were outside the Chinese embassy in New York City. And... I do not remember for the life of me why the Chinese embassy was the location. I guess for some reason they were well, cheap Chinese. Fur was maybe it was cheap. Yeah, I guess maybe it was cheap Chinese fur was starting or whatever. But we were having an anti. They were having an anti fur demonstration. And and I, outside the Chinese embassy, and you know, I remember going there. You know, there are all these animal people wearing wool and you know, with their leather shoes and whatnot. And they were all like, you know, screaming and yelling at every woman walking by really obscene things, you know, if a woman walked by with a fur coat, they were saying these really horrible things. And, um, and, you know, and I, I stopped doing that actually. And I, because I, I didn't, I didn't agree with that. Um, and the anti-fur movement has always, 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 always been horribly sexist and always horribly misogynistic. And, um, you know, and, and there is, and, and I, I don't like single issue campaigns as a general matter, because I think it's a bad idea to tell people, oh, well, you know, you eat, you know, you eat steak and you eat chicken, you know, let's go after the people who eat foie gras, you know, you wear wool, you wear leather, let's go after the people who wear fur. That suggests that there's some moral distinction. You know, you eat, you, you eat dairy, so let's criticize people who eat meat. The answer is there's no moral distinction between meat and dairy, it's all bad. So we need to be clear that animal use itself is problematic, and that these single issue campaigns have the, um, you know, have the tendency to portray some uh, products as uh, some animal uses as morally worse than others, and by implication, uh, the ones that aren't targeted are better, and that's nonsense. Okay, thank you very much. So this is a question from Bethany, and this might be the last one, because I think we want you to talk a little bit about your book after this one. Sure. We're okay. vegans. We have so, endless energy. We can go for hours, days, if you like. <laughs> I won't take you up on that one. Uh, okay, so from Bethany, we can't make everybody adopt a vegan way of life, but we can enforce laws. Shouldn't political activism towards obtaining rights for non-humans be important or as important? If non-humans had rights, veganism would become a requirement or would no longer be mistakenly seen as a personal choice. That, that, there's, we have to think about how um, laws are passed and uh, they're pretty much the same no matter which parliament or uh, legislative body is passing it. It's going to give you the least level of, of protection or impact that a consensus can come to. So who are the non-vegans who are going to pass laws that would do anything to protect the animals that they're using? It's completely the wrong way of doing it. We need more vegans so that politicians have to take account of their constituents who are vegans. We need vegans participating in the political process. We need vegans using whatever economic um, uh, impact and influence they can have. And then you start to have change, but this change will never come through a bunch of regulations um, passed in, you know, developed countries to to address what's going on with animals. It's completely the wrong way of thinking about this. We need to have a vibrant, growing community of vegans that politicians think that they have to answer to. Look, and politicians are never going to lead the way on moral issues. Trust me, I'm the, old enough to know that. And laws, the law is never going <laughs> to lead the way on moral issues. I mean, look, animals are property. It costs money to protect their interests. So, and I don't even know, you know, I, I years ago in 1995, I wrote a book called Animals, Property, and the Law. And I one of the points I made in that book was you can't talk about animal rights as long as we're using animals as resources, because what does it mean to say that a thing, something that is a resource that exists exclusively as a means to human ends, 
has a right. It, it's nonsense. Um, and so, you know, you have, there are lots of laws, you know, there are lots of laws that supposedly protect animals and they don't work. Why don't they work? Because animals are property. The same reason, by the way, there are lots of laws that protected slaves. They didn't work. Why not? Slaves were property. You have a conflict between the slave owner and a slave. The slave is going to lose and the slave owner is going to win because if that doesn't happen substantially all the time, you don't have slavery anymore. And similarly, you know, you got an animal whose property, you got property owners, they got a conflict. If the animal wins, if the, if the human property owners don't win substantially all of the time, then the institution is no longer, you know, you don't have that, you don't have the institution of animal property uh, anymore. And we have the institution of animals are property. That's what they are. They are things. They have no ex, they have no intrinsic or, or inherent value. They only have external or extrinsic value. They are things. They have economic value. That is it. You cannot talk about things that have only economic value having rights. Never going to. And, and that's why, by the way, the standard of animal welfare has largely been very low because what animal welfare does is to ensure that property owners use animal property in economically efficient ways. So if you look at like, why do we have things like slaughter, you know, laws that say that an animal has to be stunned before the animal is shackled, hoisted, and cut? The answer is because if you don't do that, and you know, you're going to have the animal moving around a lot. If you have a 2,000 pound animal hanging upside down um, in pain, the animal moves around a lot and and hits workers and incurs a lot of carcass damage. It's economically the right thing to do to stun animals, which is why, by, by the way, a lot of times if you go to a slaughterhouse, you see that the animals are not fully conscious when they're being slaughtered because they don't really have to be. In order to keep them still enough so that they don't incur carcass damage and they don't injure workers, they can still be somewhat conscious. They can still be aware and terrified. They just can't move very much because they've been stunned. So, you know, th this idea that, and that laws are going to, you know, be in the, you know, laws are going to, are going to make things better. That's not, I mean, again, that is a fantasy that is promoted by these animal, these, these animal welfare groups who want to get your money so that they can, you know, have these campaigns so they can change laws. The laws are useless. As a matter of fact, they're worse than useless. They're counterproductive because what they do is they convince people that um, there's a right way to do the wrong thing. They make people feel more comfortable about animal exploitation. Never, it's never and, I, I, and, I, and I assume, of course, that all these um, so-called animal rights political parties that are springing up all over the place are no such thing. They're all no, animal no, welfare no. parties. No, no, no. I mean, it's like I think people people um, were asking me why you know why I wasn't supporting. The humane was it the humane party whatever this you know the, the humane yeah. party well putting aside the fact that you know that the the vice presidential candidate um, is someone who is a not you know who, who rejects veganism as a moral baseline and and also and engage in, in, in engages in bigoted hate speech against anybody who criticizes her for um, her position on veganism. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, it was the, the platform of the party. And I kept on asking the question. I couldn't even get an answer. The platform of the party explicitly promoted, you know, the, the sort of the, the, the single issue campaign welfare reform sort of stuff that, you know, that all the other, that all the groups, that all of these, these supposed, these animal rights parties are nothing but animal welfare uh, enterprises. That's all they are. We are never going to get anywhere, as Anna said, the political system, the legal system is going to be largely unresponsive until we have a lot of vegans. If we had a lot of vegans, then you might see more meaningful legislation where things were actually, where practices were actually prohibited and that were prohibited in ways that were economically detrimental to property owners, because then you would have, you would have a different sort of context in which the situation would be, uh, 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 decided, but or 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 or, or um, resolved, but you know, about some social scientists at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute did a study a couple years ago, and what they found was is that if you look at history, if you can get ten percent of the population firmly believing in something, it it then instigates a lot of change. I believe if we had 10% of the population committed to abolitionist veganism, it wouldn't make everybody vegan overnight by any stretch, but it would change the conversation. Right now, the conversation is 
about how we how do we make animal exploitation more <coughs> humane? You know, that's what the that's what the 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 the, the, the current discussion is about. You know, cage free eggs, crate free pork. You know these various uh, uh, welfareist, you know these these welfareist uh, uh, measures. You know, and and we would be having a different discussion if we had to, if ten percent of the population were abolitionist vegans, then we would be starting to talk about animal use. We'd be starting to talk about the justice issue. That would then change things. That's what we need to do. That's that's the goal. The goal is to start changing the conversation. That's what we need to do. We need to change the conversation. If we could get people focused, you know, last night I was watching uh, MSNBC, which is a news channel we have here in the States. And I was watching this guy, Brian Williams, and he was talking about the, the, the um, elephant slaughter and, you know, Trump uh, deciding that he, he was going to put a hold on rescinding that, that prohibition. And and um, and he was saying he Brian Williams was saying that he was an animal lover, and he was really upset by the by the idea that they were going to allow these these animals to be shot, and he was really upset about that. And I was thinking, Brian Williams is a smart guy, and he seems you know I mean he he's expressing you know he says I care about animals. Brian Williams has never thought about the issue of animal use. He's never thought about the ideas we're talking about today because there's no context for them. We don't discuss those ideas in this society at this time. That's what we need to do. We need to get people like Brian Williams and everybody else who says, you know, I really care about animals. They need to start thinking about how can they care about animals while they're exploiting animals. We need to get people thinking about that, but that's not gonna happen on a large scale until we get more and more vegans. And I can assure Bethany that until we get a large vegan population, the law ain't gonna do nothing other than what it has been doing, which is basically making an animal exploitation more economically efficient and making people feel better about continuing to exploit animals. Okay. Well, thanks for that. And that was, so that, so I think, was the last question from the room that we're, we're going to have today. But hopefully we can have another webinar very soon to answer sure. all the un unanswered questions that um, we've been recording for you. Okay. So tell us about the new book. One thing, Alan, which will probably be a good bridge, is that um, things like uh, running for the presidency of the United States on an animal welfare oh, right. platform is, um, I believe, cheap grandstanding. Absolutely. I think there are about 1,700 people who ran for the presidency of the United States. Quite interesting, considering who we got. Um, but people do, people do that, you know, the people who think they were abducted by aliens, literally, um, run for president and all that sort of thing. And it's all um, either a, a strange psychological situation or it's cheap grandstanding. And that's exactly what this is. Mm -hmm. This hard work that needs to be done in on the local level, in your own communities, um, putting yourself out there and doing the work, stretching a little bit uh, of what you're willing and able to do. Um, not everyone comes to educational enterprises naturally or on whatever level, but everyone can do mm -hmm. it. Um, so we, we need to get over this idea that, uh, th this is a serious moral, um, issue that goes to the core of everybody and that will affect everybody's individual lives. It's not something apart. It's not something to fundraise about. It's not something that people can have, um, you know, an advocacy job for. It's everybody going out there and doing the work. And then, um, society will reflect uh, when that 10 percent or more comes into being society will take um will take note of that i mean one thing we could learn from is what in the united states if if people are watching here but similar things have probably happened in other countries recently is that some groups have been really good about getting their foot in the door the evangelical Christian community in the United States was organized Absolutely. and they did it on the local level and they were serious about it. They were passionate about it. They put themselves out and they got on local school boards. Um, they became local counselors, all those sorts of things. So, I mean, I, I, they're <coughs> on a completely different wavelength than values that I'm going to be um, campaigning for. But it's individual, local, educational campaigns, not national stuff with fundraisers and donut buttons and 
and uh, running for president on something. If, if all of the animal people, if all the people who cared about animals, um, instead of putting their efforts into these nonsense welfare campaigns and single issue campaigns, if everybody started organizing on a local level and getting people to focus on veganism, we could change the world in a relatively short period of time. I'm quite convinced of that. It's a shame that we have so much energy being directed at so, so much futile and counterproductive behavior. Um, I just, uh, something just occurred to me and it really brought it home to me what I was just saying was that someone got in touch with me because they were trying to donate um, Eat Like You Care and the Abolitionist Approach book into their local school library. Good thing to do if people wants to do that, get materials into people's hands because you don't know who's going, you'll never have a chance to reach all those people that materials could reach. So they were, were refused. And I went online and I looked and found materials that the evangelical Christians had used to get anti-gay rights materials into schools because they were saying, wait a minute, you have books about, you know, people who have lesbian mothers to, you know, to um, lesb lesbian mothers or other gay couples or something. And we, we have to be balanced here. So you have to take our anti-gay rights materials. Now that's that's not a framework that makes me comfortable that it works, but we can use that sort of thinking to say, wait a minute, you've got all this pro animal agriculture stuff there. How about having an animal rights book? Yeah. So mm -hmm. you know you can, if you've got the right ideas, we can learn from disciplined, energetic education initiatives. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, okay. The new book is called Advocate for Animals: An Abolitionist Vegan Handbook. Um, and it's got basically two parts. The first part is um, how to advocate in terms of we talk about various things you can do. Uh, and we, we have a lot of abolitionist uh, vegans who do various sorts of outreach, um, who, are part who have statements in the book about what they do. Uh, we talk about, uh, you know, talking about veganism in various contexts, including in low income situations. And then the second part of the book is what you say, the sorts of arguments you make and approaches that you use. And um, I'm excited and we're, we're excited about it. I mean, I, I, we hope it's, we think it's gonna be useful. Um, and in terms of helping people to see what they can do. Oh, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> what, I'm sick, close right, to it, it's just right. a year old now. What, what, um, I'm, I'm expecting what, to see Gary's ear come off when you do that one. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, <laughs> And, and, and so, you know, it, it's got, so, so we're focusing people on what they can do, how they can do it and what, you know, and giving them examples. We have a lot of discussions in there, you know, sample discussions of like, you know, showing how you have it, you know, how you go back and forth with somebody about these issues. And um, it focuses um, mostly on food, but then we also talk about other issues as well in terms of, you know, of, because, you know, the bottom line is, is, you're never really going to convince anybody, you know, veganism is not just about diet. It's about eating, wearing, using. It's the whole idea of exploiting non-human animals. But as long as people are relating to animals primarily as food, nothing's really going to ever change. Once you get them to focus on not eating animals, everything changes. Until you get them to focus on not eating animals, nothing changes. And so, um, but but we, you know, we, we, we talk primarily about, you um, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the idea of veganism is not eating, wearing, using animals, but then we also talk about how to advocate the other abolitionist principles about nonviolence or the relationship between human rights and animal rights and things like that. And it, it's, I, I hope it's gonna be a useful book. You know, again, like the other two books, um, we're gonna keep it cheap. Um, and, you know, we always, you know, when people buy, uh, you know, larger, you know, when they buy multiple copies for reading groups or whatever, we always, you know, we, we, uh, give them further discounts. And so we want to keep it cheap so we can get it out to everybody. Um, but it's basically, I think, going to be an, in, I hope it's going to be an interesting book. You tell us, but, um, you know, we, we, we go through a lot of things. We talk about talking to family, talking to friends. Um, we talk about, you know, uh, how to start conversations with people. Um, we talk, we have a bunch, we have a set of principles that we think, you know, if you just sort of think about these 10 ideas, it'll help inform, you know, for example, when you talk to people, 
be clear with them that you're not saying that you think that they're morally horrible people and you think that they're Nazis or you think that they're analogous to slave owners, but rather that, you know, you're focusing on something that they think is okay and, and, and you want to educate them about why it's not okay, but you're not judging them. You're talking about an institutionalized practice that you think uh, is unjust and you're going to explain why you think it's unjust. So, so, you know, it's that sort of thing. I, we're really excited about it. It should be out in a couple of weeks. Um, Right. And um, just in time great. for Christmas, yeah, just in time for Christmas. It's great. Well, when you're great. having trouble with your family, you see, you can, you can <laughs> put your kindle out and uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, think of something practical to do because next year, come on, if 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 you haven't done everything that you were in, t determined to do last time last January, let's do it better this coming year. You know, we're coming to the end of the year, there's a bit of self reflection and often a bit of depression. But um, let's inject a bit more energy, a bit more determination, a bit more discipline, um, uh, and uh, make it a really effective year. Yeah. You know, people come up to us all the time um, and say, oh, I think it's so great what you're doing, but I could never do that. And I always say to them, yes, you can, and yes, you must, because everyone will do this differently. Everyone will find a zone where they feel comfortable enough to be effective or a zone where they can be effective even if they're not feeling terribly comfortable because not every public speaker is relaxed and enjoying every minute of it. So um, I, I hope that we've presented ideas so that you can find something where you think, I can see myself doing that, I'm willing to do that, I'm willing to stretch myself, I'll use that term again, in order to try and do that and see what the result is. You don't have to table it if that's not what you feel comfortable doing. You certainly don't have to stand in any cubes of truths with masks and matching t-shirts. You, you go and explain to people um, in a context that allows give and take and communication about why this is so important to you and why you know it's right. And I think it's, I think you'll be encouraged by the results that you get. I get very few people who are rude or shout or, um, you know, give me a smart aleck response. Probably because I'm not rude or shouting to them. So it's an exchange and you can disagree with someone or often they come back because the disagreement they know is perhaps a little hollow. And most people are aware that there's a serious issue here. And most people are kind of uncomfortable about it or else they wouldn't say, don't talk to me about this. You'll put me off my dinner because indeed the idea will put them off their dinner. So it's uh, let's get out there and do this together. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that sounds like a very positive uh, note to to end the webinar on. We've got lots of uh, lots of uh, positive messages coming through for you from the chat. This one's from Violet. Love your message. This is the truth. Society will reflect when vegans emerge. The ten percent. We have the numbers. There are more people that love animals, and the tide is turned. And we're not even standing so, in a cube of truth. And it is the truth. It no. is the truth. Well, not... You'd have a bit of trouble doing a cube. You'd only yeah. two of you, wouldn't you? Yeah, exactly. It'd be hard to do a cube. But um, yeah, you know, right, yeah. not, you know, and look. I mean, let's get out there and educate. We don't need to be wearing masks. We don't need to be shouting at people in restaurants. We don't need to. We need to be educating people. Remember something. Most people care about animals. Some people don't care and you're never going to reach them. But most people, many people care about animals. Many people are uncomfortable about animal exploitation. What we need to do is educate those people about why animal exploitation is unjust. And we can do that. We don't need to be wearing masks. We don't be, and we certainly shouldn't be promoting welfareist groups or, you know, we don't need to show people violent imagery from slaughterhouses, you know, which only gets them focused on how they can make it better. Um, you know, we, we used to, many years ago, I remember we used to, when Anna and I uh, have been teaching a class on animal rights and human rights for many years. And, we, you know, we used to show in the early days, we used to show uh, these violent videos from slaughterhouses and it almost always got the students focused on issues of treatment. Whoa, that's really terrible. Can't they do it better? That's what all of, you know, all of that, all of that violent imagery, the number of people who are actually sort of look at that violent imagery and then say, oh, I'm going to become a vegan. Um, again, I haven't done an empirical study, but I'd be surprised if it's very big based on the experiences I've had over the past, you know, 30 some odd years. Um, people tend to focus on treatment. When you show them horrible treatment, they tend to focus on treatment. You have a much interesting, much better discussion if you sort of say to somebody, 
It doesn't really matter how humanely you treat the animals. It's wrong to do. If you can live without killing, if you can be healthy, if you can live a good life without harming another sentient being, why wouldn't you do that? You know, it's not really rocket science. It's what most people believe. We just need to sort of tease it out more. So there you go. Um, and so we've got uh, just one more message here from, or one more comment from uh, Janina. It says, thank you. I always feel invigorated after listening to you. So, and we've get got quite there, a few get messages. Out, get, out Very positive. get out there. You know, look, you can do this. You know, you don't yes. need anybody else to do it. You don't need to write a check to some organization. Oh, you can do it. You can do it. You've got to do it. If we don't do it together, if we don't, those of us who care about, about, about this issue, if we don't do it, nobody else is going to do it. The large groups yeah, sure. aren't going to do it. I can tell you that. Sure. Sure. So it just remains for me to say thanks very much for everyone who, to everyone who attended. Uh, thanks for asking the questions. Hopefully we'll have another webinar fairly soon where we can um, answer the questions that haven't been dealt with today. I think the moderators have been making a note of them. Um, so we'll have, we'll have a good basis for, for another webinar. Let's say also thank you to our team of moderators who've been beavering away in the background. Yeah, so that's uh, that's, that that's Francis, Jenny, Tracy, Christina, Vanda, Carter, and Peggy. So seven of them. Right. It's like trying to remember the seven dwarfs, but I managed to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So okay, that's lovely. And of much. course, especially thank you very much for Garrett, to Gary and Anna. It's been terrific as usual. Our pleasure and um, privilege. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, Alan. Bye for now. Thank you, Alan. Cheers. Bye, Bye for now. Bye.